I've heard of a long-distance swimmer named Christopher Swain, who's got an attack story to tell. He takes me back to the place where he came face to face with a primitive creature from the deep. Can you take me through exactly what happened? I was in the midst of a 129 mile swim of the entire length of the lake. Most of the days were relatively uneventful. It's the same old thing. That day I'd been swimming for two or three hours already. The very first thing felt a lot like when your mobile phone's in your pocket and it vibrates. And the next thing I thought was that I'd caught on something. Sometimes it's a plant. But what plant could catch him in a hundred foot of water? So I reached down to brush whatever it was on my leg off. And I touched a living thing that was attached to me. There was uh, something uh, thicker than my wrist around that was moving like this. That I just had a bit of a freak out. I don't, because it, what, the next image that I saw when I put my goggles in was snake-like. I made another try to grab it, and it slimed right out of my hand. So this thing that's on your leg, it's writhing around, what was it? It turned out to be a, about three and a half, four foot long sea lamprey. Sea lampreys are survivors from the depths of time. Like aquatic vampires, the adults are blood parasites that attach to other fish to feed when in the ocean, but they head into freshwater to spawn. Their mouths are made up of a powerful suction disc lined with rows of needle-sharp teeth. In the center lies the ultimate weapon, a piston-like tongue tipped with rasping plates, which bores its way into its host. Once attached, it may feed for hours, days, or even weeks, growing fat on its prey's blood. I ended up pulling it off, and the first time I pull it off, it shot back on. They don't want to be removed. So I got a hold of the thing finally, and I managed to throw it. So I remember seeing it like in the air, like a snake flailing around and go fall. This thing, it, it somehow just short-circuited your rational response in a way? You know, I've been caught in lightning storms. I've swum through nuclear waste. I've been run over by boats. This is the thing that got to me the most. They're extremely fast, extremely aggressive, they're very hard to fight, they're very difficult to kill, and they want your blood and nutrients. I'm hundreds of miles up the Amazon on the hunt for the electric eel with the Matisse tribe. It's chaos as the hunters try to bring the fish into shallow water. Right, I'm now in water. I struggle to get close. The eel writhes to get free. Finally, Bushy, the man who brought me here. I can see it, you can see it trembling, you can see it trembling. Holds a live electric eel in his bare hands. He's just holding that, he's holding it. I've seen what these fish are capable of. I'm not too comfortable being this close. He says it is shocking. This is the fish that is responsible for killing people. And according to others, actually burning their skin. But looking at uh, Bushy now, no sign of any burns. He's been holding this now for several minutes. I'm left with two possible conclusions. Either the Matisse have special powers, because they have this understanding that I don't completely follow, scientists don't completely follow, or something else is responsible for the bizarre deaths. I'm in the Okavango Delta in Botswana to find out if tigerfish really are man-eaters. To test this, I need to get in the water, but the water here is also stalked by crocodiles. Two, one, go. I'm most vulnerable at the surface, which Brad calls the kill zone. To a lurking croc, my silhouette would present a clear and tempting target. So to minimize the risk of an attack, I descend quickly to the riverbed.
I've got a camera fixed to my dive stick to record any encounters with either tigerfish or crocodiles. And my mask has a built-in microphone, hardwired to a recorder on my back. I can also talk to the dive boat, but communications must be kept to a minimum, as the sound waves could attract crocodiles. It's a totally different world from how you imagine it. See how it'd be very easy to blunder into something. They do say about crocodiles, it's the ones you can't see you should worry about. So, eyes peeled. It's hard to stay relaxed in this nerve-wracking situation. But if I breathe too hard, I'll quickly use up my air supply. The first signs of life are some squeaker catfish, named after the strange noises they make. Nice to see some of the fish down here. They stick close together, partly for protection, but whether from tigerfish or crocs, I'm not sure. Almost like being in a plane and flying into a thunderstorm. It's all bright around you and you're just being taken, in this case by the current, to this area of dark. But actually as you approach, it lightens up, but you're always rather concerned about what might be there. I have to remind myself that I'm here to find tigerfish. So far, there's no sign of them and my dive time is running out. Could the tigerfish have moved on, I wonder? Or is my presence down here making them wary? Croc! Is this in a croc? Is this in a croc? This looks quite big. This more or less went right down onto a crocodile. It looks right at me and keeps moving. I follow it, trusting in Brad's theory that the water is still too cold for this large reptile to be in feeding mode. But even if this is true, the croc will still bite me if I get too close to its head. And with a large, struggling object clamped in its jaws, it could then throw itself into a death roll, spinning its body with enough force to dismember me. I am within about a foot of its tail. Unbelievable, unbelievable that I can get this close. I don't even touch it. I've just touched its tail. Who would have thought this is possible? Holding the tail of a crocodile, a live crocodile underwater. But actually, in theory, it makes perfect sense. When their body temperature is low, and when we are on the bottom like this, not creating a silhouette against the surface, they don't see us as a threat. And I can do this. Unbelievable. Talk about putting theory into practice. But it won't be long before the water and crocs like this one are getting dangerously warm. For now, though, the beast's intentions seem benign. 